Let us pray. Father, we thank you once again for granting us our lives and protecting us and bringing us together once again to assemble under your feet. We are grateful for this opportunity to fellowship with you and to fellowship with one another. And we pray that your presence will be with us so that this whole day will be filled with life with you. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 20, verse 1 to 16 is our passage for consideration this morning. The, para the parable of the workers in the vineyard, that is the title in the New International Version of the Scriptures. Matthew 20. And I read it. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and send them into his vineyard. About nine in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon, and about, and about three in the afternoon, and did the same thing. About five in the afternoon, he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, you also go and work in my vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his former, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about five in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those, came, those who came were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have, I have the right to do what I want with my own mess money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. The word of God. Shall we sing 579? Savior, thy dying love that thou gavest me. Let's sing through all the stanzas.
The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers. If I were to select a theme for the passage, that is what it would be. Even though when one listens to the content of that parable, it is possible your attention might be drawn to so many other things. But just as the beginning of the parable says, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers. And so the parable is about people who come into the kingdom of heaven, members of God's kingdom. That is, it is not about the rewards. The rewards are attitudes that arise within us as God in his, in his own way brings people into his kingdom. But the particular thing that the parable talks about is about citizens of God's kingdom. And unfortunately, sometimes the wrong attitudes that arises in us or others when other people are brought into the kingdom. But, but it is interesting to consider the reactions of the workers as the, the parable has it. We are told in simple terms that this is a man who went out to hire workers. Six o'clock in the morning, nine o'clock in the morning, 11, at 12, and as late as five o'clock. And uh, the working day lasted from six to six. Unlike our uh, eight hours here, in his daylight time, it was six to six. It's very tedious. You have to bear the brunt of the sun, the noonday heat, to qualify for a day's wage. People have said that in Ghana, uh, our remunerations are very low, which I think is true. But it's also, I don't know whether it is because as a result of that, we also don't work hard. We don't, uh, President Kofor said that we pretend to pay as they pretend to work. It seems it's very true. Our wage levels are very low and our attitude to work are very bad. The two go together. I don't know where we will have to correct it from. The, the chicken before the hen or the hen before the egg or something. But we think we, we have to do something about it. I think that is why the, re the reason why the private enterprises thrive better than public service. Because public service, it doesn't matter whatever you do, you receive that salary or wage. But in the private man who, who is uh, profit oriented, you can't just take his, his or her money without doing serious work. And I promise that is the way to go compared to our Christian thinking. Work hard and earn your living. That is another matter for the day. But for the day, for today, it is about citizens of God's kingdom. This man does this, and at the close of the day, he pays each of them one denarius. We are told that a denarius was the, perhaps in our terms, you will say the minimum wage. It was fixed. If you, if you hired the services of a, la a, a laborer, at the end of the day, the person was entitled to one denarius. So in actual fact, he paid them a day's wage. But the problem that the other people had was that why some of us worked for 11, uh, 12 hours, others worked for 11, others for 6, and, and others for 9. So we were expecting that. In fact, they were not expecting that. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the expectation was that they would receive their daily wage of uh, denarius, and the others will be rated proportionally to the number of hours that they worked. Unfortunately, they didn't see it that way. And so that arose, it generated some kind of confusion amongst the, them. And as the whole process went on, uh, the, the parable is properly crafted, crafted in such a way that to arise some tension within us. Why don't pay the, those who came in the morning first? These questions will not have arisen. Uh, you came at 6 o'clock, you agreed to a daily, uh, a daily wage of uh, dinarius. At 6 o'clock, get your dinarius and go away, and then that will have been fine. And those who came in later at 9 o'clock, if they received dinarius, those ones will have been gone. They wouldn't have seen. So they will, not, they will not have the cause to complain. But perhaps this parable wanted to ask us to uh, bring out something in us and to deal with it. That is why it is crafted the way it is crafted for us. And so they all observe, and 
because of the way the landowner processed the payment, those who came very early in the morning, as they saw those who worked for just for one hour receiving a denarius, praise the Lord. Today we will get it. This man is very generous. People have worked for only one hour and they have received a, a denarius. So we, you can begin to work the proportions. One hour equals to one denarius, and therefore 12 hours will be 12 denarius. So their expectations were very high. They were expecting very highly from the landowner. Unfortunately, their expectations were not met. And that's how come that the grumbling, which always becomes part of us, when we are in situations like this, arose. They began to grumble. And this grumble, one thing that we fail, or perhaps they fail, or we fail to understand is that this parable is not about the workers. It is about entry into the kingdom of heaven. What is the criterion? It is not a matter of who worked 12 hours, or 11 hours, or 12 hours, or even of 9 hours. Our entry into the kingdom of God, or perhaps should we say our salvation, if we are to properly state it, is not end. Our salvation is a result of God's grace. And in fact, when one gets this one right, the rest falls in place. It is not something that you have worked to earn. It is an act of God's grace. God decides that I want to bring people into my vineyard to work. It doesn't matter who you are and at what time you come. I want people in my vineyard. And whether you came at 6 o'clock or at 9 or at 11 or 12 or even at 5 o'clock, it is all God's own act of grace. The landowner would not have been blamed by anybody if he, had, if he had decided not to employ anybody for the day. They will all remain in the marketplace standing there looking for opportunities for, uh, for, for job, but will not have gotten it. And so the way would have been wasted all the same, whether you came at 6 or whether it's at 9 or 11. The entry into God's kingdom, we must understand, is God's own gracious act. It is not something that we have earned, something that we have achieved by our own strength. And so, in actual fact, there is no cause for complaint. The moment we forget that the entry to the kingdom is God's own gracious act, then the attitudes that we see coming, arising from that last, uh, uh, the, 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 the petitioner come, uh, uh, comes to, to being. You begin to be, look at, you become self-absorbed in yourself. When that happens, uh, you don't think about anyone else. You're only thinking about myself. Oh, that man who worked one hour got a denarius. Therefore, I must get. You want to insist on it. You begin to focus more on yourself instead of focusing on the, on the owner of the work. It is he who owns everything. It is he who decides everything. It is he who wants his work to be done. It is not you. The moment you begin to center everything about yourself, you become absorbed in yourself. You forget that somebody also is doing some, something differently elsewhere. And so it is difficult for God to entertain that one. When you begin to complain, and that is what, when you are self-absorbed, that is usually the reaction. You begin to grumble and complain. They did just that. Oh, he's not fair. Oh, it's not equitable. And you begin to complain and complain. But in the real case, you don't deserve it. It is something that he has graciously given to you. And perhaps you receive it and say thank you. The best you should do. Acknowledge what he has done for you. At least for employing me for one day. Today my family were fed because you, you granted me the opportunity to work so that I could get some income to, sep to support the family. When we begin to compare, even as the people did, uh, comparison should be done from two angles. You don't compare from only one angle. The moment you say you want to compare, you are thinking about two different things or even more. And if you are thinking about two different things or more, then if you are doing the objective work, then you look at the condition and the situation of each of these positions. 
But you listen to the man, all he's interested in is himself. Himself. You become self-absorbed. You think only about your well-being and uh, what you come to you. You don't consider the status of others. What do you say that the person who, uh, the laborers who came in at uh, five o'clock would say? Would they say the same things that this man was saying? They will receive the one denarius. Oh, praise God. This man is wonderful. They will begin to praise him. But you don't see that one because you are thinking only about yourself. Yes, you have suffered, you have burnt the brunt of the noonday heat, but you got your due. He has graciously given what he wants to the other person. Why not praise the man? Oh, the man is generous. These were people, even though they worked for him one hour, one hour, but he's giving them a full day's wage. The man is generous. You don't praise him for that. You only complain about what you think should have been given to you. And this kind of attitudes arouses in us almost every time when we begin to compare. Why is this man in this position and I am not there? To the extent that sometimes we resent God. We resent God's gracious acceptance of sinners. Some people think that we have been born into Christian families, households. My father was a, a priest, or perhaps he was a, a sorry like myself. My father was a sorry like myself, and therefore I must go to heaven. That man, oh, the, oh, 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 all the family, the ancestors, they were all thieves. And then at the tail end of the person's life, he converts, and he's going to heaven. And then you begin, you begin to stand there, and then you complain. Complain to who? It is God who is in control. It is he who owns everything. I was born into a Christian family because it is not something that I did myself. It was God who prepared that grant for me. So it's all act of grace. You don't have anything over and above the other persons. So whatever God gives you, perhaps the right thing to do is to be, as it were, uh, grateful to God. For what he has done to you and stop looking at what others have received the moment you begin to look at what others have received instead of being grateful for what you have received you begin to grumble and complain and that that makes your service or your condition as a christian very questionable christians should not be concerned too much about what others have received indeed if they are, if they are to show concern they must give thanks to god that yes god is grateful like the, the thief who died on the cross with Jesus Christ, uh, by, by Jesus Christ. Yes, he had been a thief all his life, and he was being punished for his own offenses. Yet Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. And we should praise Jesus Christ for that, for being that gracious. Otherwise, if he is going to uh, judge us, each and every one of us, not according to his grace, but his words, who amongst us will also qualify? We will all lose it, and we cannot get it. Unfortunately, sometimes uh, people are resentful to God, just as this man did. Why should God save this man? Or why should God place this man in the same position as I also, somebody who has done this or that? And sometimes even it comes to our church life. I've been in this church all these years, and I've served the church so many years. This man came quite later. You don't see these things here in a Ridge church, but go to the villages. People in a particular community think that the church there is theirs. Somebody comes in later, perhaps with some, a, a, a lot of contribution to make, and they are elevated to leadership positions so they can think for the church. It becomes a problem. We have served in this church all these years. Our efforts are not being recognized. But the position being requested for, you don't have the capacity. And still, our people will grumble. To the extent that if you have watched carefully, because I've, as a pastor, I've traveled a, little, a wider letter. Wherever you go, whether it is in Accra, whether it is in Kumasi, whether it is in Fantilan, wherever you go, every church which is composed of only natives, natives it, it doesn't grow. They are always thinking about what I did not receive. That man came and they gave him that position. And so, grumbling begins. The churches that thrive are the churches that are mixed up so that nobody will lay claim to the ownership of that particular church. And everybody is prepared and willing to contribute his or her part for the good of that church. It happens in God's church. We resent God's generosity. Sometimes we are jealous. Jealous of the well-being of others, what God has given to another person. 
Sometimes you hear, especially the women, ah, but this girl, pa, why should this uh, burger marry this girl? It should have been my daughter. And they begin to complain. These are kinds of attitudes that we put up as human beings, forgetting always that it is always God's grace in action and not what we, what we have worked or earned for ourselves. Brothers and sisters, that is the attitude which is killing us and which is uh, ungodly in the eyes of God. God asks the question, have I no right to use my money for what I want? We cannot challenge God for being gracious. And in fact, we don't have any grounds. But even if we should challenge God, then we are perhaps challenging the validity, validity of our own acceptance. Because none of us can claim that he or she worked for the kingdom that we all strive to enter into. Brothers and sisters, this is the parable that God wants us to, as it were, to focus on what God has done for me. At least, stop thinking about what others have received and be ungrateful to God. Think about what God has done for me. That you shall sing, like that song will be sang, count your blessings. Count your blessings. Stop counting the blessings of others so that, as it were, you say, oh, God has not been fair to me. And for some people, they are always talking about unfairness. Oh, it is not, a, it is not, it is not equitable. God is not fair. You can con Continue to complain and blame God for his inequitableness, whatever you think it is. But he is still God. And he owns everything. And even if he, is, he, he, he will listen to what you are saying and will want to judge you according to your works, you yourself will be found wanting. Why not praise God for what you have received? The reason is that we fail to acknowledge what God has done for us to the extent that we are only look, looking at what, what he has done for other people and then so, so that we can blame him for being unfair. Some people will say God doesn't know arithmetic. How do you pay somebody who has worked for one hour at Dinarius and somebody working in the same conditions for 12 hours, you pay that person at Dinarius? His arithmetic is no good at all. God doesn't follow our arithmetic. It is an act of grace that he gives us. And we should be thankful Rather, accept what he has given us so freely, considering that you were the only person alive. No other person exists. So God has been gracious to you. Acknowledge that one. Acknowledge that one. And wholeheartedly give thanks and praise him for it. Even if what you have, something will be added to it, it will depend on what God, how, how you received what was uh, uh, first given to you. And this is the way that we should be going as Christians. Citizens of heaven must acknowledge God's goodness to them. Accept, right, and be gracious and be thankful, I should say. Be thankful to God for bringing me into that situation. Remember, there are so many people who have not gotten what you have got. You blame God. You claim him for not being equitable. But there are others who will look at you and say, oh, you are blessed, but you don't know. Let us look into ourselves and see how God has blessed us. The fact that even you are a Christian, you have not thought about it at all. How God suffered to get you to be a Christian. You are now in the, in the fold of Christ and you are now looking at others and because they are blessed, you become jealous about it. You don't have any right to do that. That is what the, uh, the parable seeks to tell us. So as I conclude, I want us, or we need always, to focus perhaps on ourselves and how God has treated us so graciously. Stop looking around. Stop looking, uh, looking at others and how God has blessed them. Yes, it is a good thing. Even if you should do that, you should do that with a mind intent on please, uh, sati, uh, praising God for what he has done. And not just to blame him. And the moment you begin to grumble and then you complain, it makes you ineffective in your own calling. To the extent that if you're not careful, you lose your own calling or your salvation. Let's focus on what God has given us. Who am I? Where have I come from? How did I get here? Has not God intervened or has not God done anything useful in your lives for which you can be grateful and say thank you all the time? Let us look at these. If you are to take another look to others, let us look at them with the eye or the intent to see what God has done for them also and to praise God for it, not to blame. 
or to complain against him. That way, it will help us to be effective and productive. You will encourage other people also to come into the kingdom, God using us. In fact, that is the whole purpose why he first called us. He first called us so that we can be a conduit through which he can bring others. And if we begin to, when we come in, we begin to sit down there, enjoy the blessings, and begin to complain at others who also come in, then where will we be going? These things should also be practiced not only in our Christian life, but in our national lives, as individuals, as human beings. Let us always look at what, by God's grace, we have received. Accept it and thank God and work for it. Begin to work with the, uh, the kind of thought or the thinking that I began with. Oh, wages in Ghana are so low. And then you equate it. Therefore, you know what comes out. And when are we going to redeem ourselves from this poor state of our economy? When we continually, we will not work hard and we will st still work, uh, want salaries to be, as it were, upgraded. When the salaries are not upgraded, then we raise up the red flags. When are we going to get better? Somebody must work first to improve our economy. And at least it's something that we have as citizens of this country to make it our duty, especially those of us who are Christians, that we must be prepared and willing to work hard so that our economy will get better. We don't have to um, uh, make it a condition that things must be made better before we begin to work hard. When that happens, it's never going to happen. And we are going to wallow in this condition and perhaps leave it worse for our, our children and the children's children. So let us, as it were, revise our thoughts and actions. That the Lord himself will be merciful. He has always been merciful. He's been always been gracious. We have always been talking about Ghana being, what is it, a, a peaceful land. Yesterday I was looking at something on the, uh, on, 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 on the internet, a Nigerian who had come to Ghana, and he was very happy. Ghana, the ha I'm now in the happiest country in Africa. Comparing Ghana to where he came from, he had a lot of reasons to praise God for it. And we are in it. But we don't, see, we don't seem to look at the positive things that we can enjoy here, always thinking about the negatives. I'm not saying we shouldn't think about our difficulties. We should. But we shouldn't place them higher above what God has given us. Let us celebrate God for what he does for us. Let us praise God for making us Ghanaians. Let us work hard to make Ghana a better place so we can even get more better. That others who come here will perhaps acknowledge, uh, will see paradise in Ghana. It is possible. So let us work hard. And it's a mindset. It begins in the mind. When the mind is not changed, all the others will continue the way they do. It will not help us. It will be agitation over agitation. Wasting of man hours unnecessarily when we still complain about some of these things in our, in our economy. May the Lord himself help us. And for us as Christians, shall we set the good examples? Let us correct our mindset. The kingdom of God is gracious, given of God, of his own son, for our deliverance. We have not in, done anything to warrant it. Let us work hard so that when we are in there and praise God for it, we will also work to bring others to the kingdom. Ghana cannot thrive if we accept what God has given us, acknowledge it, and then work towards its improvement. It is possible. For Christ, there is no impossibility. Let us pray. Thank God for the message today, especially for the fact that we are members of God's kingdom, not because of anything that we have done, but it's a result of God's praise, grace. Let's thank him for it. Stop looking at others and blaming God. Thank God he has done enough for us. And especially as Ghanaians, let's thank God because at least we can be granted amongst the most prosperous or even peaceful nations, at least in Africa. Thank God for that. Then pray for our nation.
Ghana. Yes, we have been touted as the most peaceful in Africa, or one of the most peaceful countries in Africa, but you are still not there. Let's pray for peace in Ghana. There seem to be uh, a lot of agitations around. Let us pray to God that he himself will help us to overcome all such tendencies and work towards the improvement of our nations. And as we do that, let us pray also for those into whose hands the, uh, the governing of this nation has been trusted to, also to think about a citizenship and continue to put in place good plans that will enable our country to further flourish, to glorify God. Let's pray for the executive. That God will open the way for all their good intentions to be practicalized in our nation. Let's pray also for all the various arms of government. That each will be mindful about God's grace to us as a people called Ghanaians. Grab it in with, the, with both hands. Give praise to him by working harder to improve upon it to his glory. And you can, you can personalize the message this morning to yourself. Personalize it to yourself. Apply it for your own situation, not only to the government. Apply it to yourself. Are you jealous because God has prospered other people? Are you jealous? Do you have any reason to do that? Confess, if you have. Do you resent God when he decides to, just, uh, to justify sinners, to save them? Confess to God. You are being presumptuous. You are thinking too much of yourself. Ask him to grant you a faithful heart likeness to his. A heart that is very humble and willing to serve so that God's glory might be seen. Commit yourself to God's care for the day. And pray that his spirit will protect you and guide you in everything that you do. Almighty, we thank you for this morning and for everything that has gone on here. We pray that you yourself will grant us the right way of thinking to acknowledge the good things that you have done for us as individuals and as a people, that praising and working hard all the blessings that you have for us will also be received. We thank you for hearing us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Unto God's gracious keeping and commitment, a commitment I, co I cover you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you his peace now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.